cards that are in your order of worship so that we can stay in touch with you. And if you are visiting with us for the first or second or third time, uh, please make sure that you do that so that we can be in touch with you. Also want to invite you to a lunch next week. After seconds, after this hour of worship, we'll meet down in 101. If you are interested in getting more information about us as a worshiping community, uh, meet some of the staff. You're invited to a lunch next week after this hour of worship. Just note that on your connection card or call the church office next week and let them know that you will be joining us. Jeannie Stasco, where are you? Way in back. There's Jeannie. Jeannie is uh, our representative. She's going on a mission trip to Louisiana. When, Jeannie? 26th through the 29th. 26th through the 29th. She will be on the patio after worship, and we're looking for um, to underwrite her mission trip a little bit. So she will be out there. She can answer questions about what she'll be doing, and you will gratefully receive any support that you want to offer her. You can also make a check payable to the church and put in the memo block that it's for her mission trip and we'll make sure that she, she gets that. Jeff, concert. Sometime soon, I think. You guys remember that, right? <laughs> Next Sunday at 4 o'clock right here, we're going to have two of our most wonderfully loved groups, Higher Ground and Kingsman, together on the same stage. Right here. Four o'clock, they're going to be doing some spirituals, some beautiful songs, and some that are just a lot of fun. So if you want to show up, bring a friend. Four o'clock, be about an hour, and good, our free will offering is all we're going to ask. So thank you. We'll see you here. And because he usually says they don't charge for admission, but you do have to pay to get out. <laughs> okay. Sunday school kickoff, Diane. Today is the start of our Sunday school kickoff. During children's time, we're going to dedicate our teachers, and I have tags for the kids to put on their backpacks to bless them. But um, also for a special treat at the end of the service, we have the Kona Hawaiian ice or shaved ice truck coming today for everybody to have a small shaved ice. So we have a hundred reserved and. You're all the children of God, so make sure you get over there and get some. Kim, a word about your class, please. Week after next, right after this service, downstairs at 101, I'm going to start an invitation to the New Testament class, and I hope that you will join me. Child care is available, so the kids just stay in Sunday school, or we'll work that out, but let will be care for them. And we'll spend an hour learning how... Um, Following Jesus can transform our lives. So a couple of the headings are Jesus calls us to a transformed life. Jesus calls us to minister in a hostile world. Jesus calls us to complex communities of faith. It sounds relevant. Um, so I hope that you'll join me. We'll have a sign-up list on the patio next week and the books available. Thank you. I also want to let you know that next week our Bishop Grant, Bishop Grant Higuilla, will be here in San Diego. He'll be down at San Diego First United Methodist Church at 2 p.m. Grant will bring to us the three recommendations from the Council on uh, Bishops on the way forward as we examine the issue of human sexuality in our church. And we'll want to take note of that and perhaps attend. Then this month, September, is the beginning of Disaster Preparedness Month, and Stan Schroeder, who is on our Board of Trustees, is our safety coordinator, is going to tell us a little bit about what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Thanks. Today begins the first of three Sundays focusing on emergency readiness. With incidents of fire, earthquake, and other types of emergencies all around us, it's very important that we are prepared. In addition to being prepared at church, we would like to encourage you and help you become prepared at home to take care of yourself and your family. The County of San Diego offers a terrific pamphlet, Family Disaster Plan and Personal Survival Guide, which walks you through, step by step, preparing to deal with a major disaster. The pamphlet offers lists of supplies that you should have at home, 
how to repair your home, what to do after disaster hits, and provide a central document to make notes about important information like shutoff valves. And also your reunion location with your family. As you leave today, uh, we will hand out one guide per family. We strongly urge you to take a little time, go through the pamphlet, be prepared. The County of San Diego also offers an app for your smartphone called San Diego Emergency. And the San Diego Emergency app keeps you alerted to fires, evacuation areas, and shelters, and more. If you have ever been evacuated due to a fire or had a fire near your home, you know how important it is to get up-to-date information. This app provides that. Instructions for getting the app are included on this insert in your bulletin. If you need help installing the app, please talk to a staff member or drop by the office this week. Next week, we'll learn about our evacuation plan for this sanctuary during a Sunday emergency. And in two weeks, Sunday the 23rd, we'll actually hold an evacuation drill here after the Sunday services. Thank you. So a lot of work has gone into preparing us for this, and I want to thank Renata Friedland for all of her work in preparing, prepping us for this. So now we begin worship, and I invite you to stand and greet each other.
us use our voices to declare those things we have said and done that have separated us from God and from each other, that we may experience God's mercy and receive God's forgiveness. You have called us, O oh God, and we have refused to listen. You have stretched out your hand, and we have not taken it. the message this week, didn't you? You're all here. Yay! Or at least most of you are. Today is a special day because we start our new year of Sunday school. So you've got some of your familiar teachers and some new ones. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray over all of our teachers. So teachers who are teaching this year, if you could stand. There's some of them. And congregation, if you can take out the yellow flyer, I know they're all color-coded. Find the yellow one. And I'm going to ask you to help us pray over these teachers. Today we celebrate the growth of our children and youth as they mature in faith and mature in years. Please join me in prayer. Oh God. You have created us as human beings who mature from infancy through childhood and adolescence into adulthood. Today we celebrate that growth. We lift up all who move this day into new classes of learning and spiritual growth. We pray for all who teach our children and youth. We pray for all who classes and groups in which we mature in faith. Keep each child and youth in your care and keep us ever mindful of the promise we make each time we baptize another in faith. That we will assist them to grow in knowledge, in spiritual practices, and in living as disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all for that. You may sit. And for all of you, I see a couple. You brought your backpacks because you need to bless them. So if you didn't bring your backpack, put out your hands 
just as if you had your backpack with you. You can put it right down here. You don't have your, oh, see, there, there's some others. It's okay. You don't have a backpack? <laughs> no, okay, well, I'm gonna give you something, okay? I'm gonna give you something, but put your hands up like this, or hold your backpack, and we're gonna say, dear God, bless this, oh, here comes some more. <laughs> Bless this pack, allow it to help me to grow, allow it to be filled with the tools and the energy and all that I need to make this year a great year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I have a tag, but I'm going to give it to you at the end of Sunday school. But on this tag it says, this is a blessed backpack. And it says San Carlos United Methodist Church. And then it has a nice blessing on the back side for you. Okay. You left it at home? Okay, well you can still put this on when you get home, okay? Okay, let's all go to Sunday school now, okay? Reading from the Psalms. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
problems with our sound system the last few weeks, so I'm just going to talk real loud. <laughs> our second reading is from the eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. And he called the crowd and his disciples and said to them, If you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save them. <clears throat> for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Our hymn is number 454, Open My Eyes and I May See. And you may actually have to use your finger today. <laughs> you may not be able to bring it up on the screen for you. Can you stand and let's sing together? Take it. 
And even though there are a number of ways for this passage to be examined, most of them are rather predictable. So the challenge for me was, what am I going to say about this passage that hasn't really been said over and over? In these nine verses, there are so many wonderful points that can be taken and explored, it's difficult to know which way to go. But then I realized that the story in this passage is about the direction things are going to go. So much has happened leading up to this passage, healings, feedings of multitudes, the inclusion of aliens, outcasts, and immigrants, all of which has led to serious confrontations with religious authorities. The twelve are joyful, the crowds have been large, and what has been happening has been joyful and predictable. So Jesus' question, who do people say that I am, is not really totally beyond comprehension. The word is out about this itinerant preacher from Nazareth who is rattling the established order. So what's the word on the street? Who do people say that Jesus is? What's the popular consensus about what's happening? So the question, who is Jesus, seems logical and timely. Which the Twelve are open and eager to respond to, because they also have an idea about the direction things are going to go. The answer to the question, who do you say that I am, is followed the answer or the question, who do people say that I am, is followed by a second question. Who do you say that I am? Well, now that's a little more uncomfortable, a little more unsettling. The answer to that question may reveal a lot more about who we are than about who Jesus is. The answer to that question has some implications for a new direction in their lives. It's one thing to reveal who other people say he is. It's quite another to do the soul-searching response to who do I say he is. How we answer that question will not only define who Jesus is, but perhaps define who we are, too. So perhaps the question truly is, who do you say that you are? It may reveal who he is and who we're called to be instead of who we think we are. And that's uncomfortable, to say the least. Who I say he is may require a shift in the direction my life takes. So it got pretty quiet after that question was asked. Bishop Hagia, as I said, will bring us the recommendation of the Council of Bishops will propose as we bring new directions for our church with regard to the inclusion and respect of LGBTQ persons in our church. For many, this is a long overdue direction change or proposed change. And how we deal with that change will tell us who we are. There are many who think it's overdue, many who think it's a wrong choice. But how we answer that question will tell us who we are. So the question of who Jesus is is always relevant and always timely. So in trying to illuminate this very familiar passage in some new way, I have to admit and confess to you that I was a little bit perplexed. I was a little in the dark, frankly. And I came upon a story, the story of Nasruddin. Nasruddin is a holy man in the Sufi tradition from about the 14th century, and there are a number of Nasruddin stories. Nasruddin is sort of a Sufi version of Yogi Berra. <laughs> Nasruddin is a wise fool, and every culture and tradition has a wise fool. And there are any number of Nasruddin stories that illuminate things in something of a hilarious and questioning way. So there's this story. Nasruddin is coming home late one night from the village, and he stops, and a neighbor finds him underneath a street lantern, on his knees, searching diligently in the grass and in the dirt for something, and the neighbor says, Mullah, what are you looking for? And he says, I lost the only key to my house, and I'm searching for it. So the neighbor gets down on his knees and begins to search with him for it, unsuccessfully, and after a time, the neighbor stands up and says, Mullah, are you sure it was here that you lost your key? And he said, oh, no, no, I didn't lose it here. <laughs> and the neighbor says, well, Mullah, 
if you did not lose the key here, where did you lose it? He goes, I lost it over there. And he points to the front of his house that's enshrouded in darkness. And the neighbor says, well, if you lost the key over there, well, then why are you searching for it here? And he says, because this is where the light is. <laughs> I've always thought of Peter as a little bit of our version of Nasruddin. He's a wise fool. He it seems immediately enlightened, and then again in a moment, not so much. <clears throat> Pardon the pun, but today's story shows Peter in this light. A wise fool who at first sees the light and then refuses to go in the direction Jesus reveals things are going to go. And that's the direction I want to explore with you a little bit this morning. This is the midpoint in Mark's Gospel. From this point on, things are going to go in a direction no one had anticipated. It's going to move in the direction of some darkness, because that's where the key is going to be found. Our story says that they were on the way to Caesarea Philippi. Being on the way is a significant phrase, because it seems that all transformations, all awakenings, all changes happen while we're on the way from someplace familiar to someplace not yet reached. It's on the way that Jesus asks these two questions and tells them of a direction change that's coming. He will ask them who people say that he is, and how do people see me? How am I perceived? What's the general understanding of how things are going to go, and the truth that I bring? Their response is that some say he's John the Baptist, others say he's Elijah or one of the other prophets. But he's seen then as someone from the past, not as someone new not as someone with his own light to bring. Which prompts him to take the focus much deeper and more personal, to take the focus from the universal to the personal, and ask, who do you say that I am? Another way of asking that question, what is it that you see in me? And suddenly, it gets real quiet. It gets uncomfortable and no one knows exactly how to respond or what to say. And then it's Peter. Peter who says, blurts out, you are Messiah. Out of nowhere, Peter comes up with this revealing and he sees Jesus clearly. Peter sees Jesus as Messiah. Now, what Messiah means to a first century Jew would take us down a path I want to leave for a different sermon or perhaps a Tuesday night class. But what we know is this, Messiah means someone who will liberate me from some kind of oppressive rule. And what I want to emphasize this morning is that Peter sees Jesus in a specific light, Messiah. In Matthew's telling of this story, Jesus' response to Peter's proclamation is this, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you but the Spirit. Peter speaks with an understanding and a perception from another part of himself, with a light that burns brighter than he knows. And in that instant, Peter sees Jesus through a new lens, a new set of eyes, so to speak. But he's also projecting on Jesus an understanding of Messiah that is old and perhaps not yet completely changed. And then, Jesus reveals an unsettling shift in the way things are going to go. And it doesn't fit their anticipated understanding of the direction things are going to go. He tells them that the authorities will arrest him, they will kill him, and he will rise on the third day. The way that they're going is going to get dark before the light of resurrection can be seen. The light at the end of the tunnel may be an open and empty tomb, but right now they're in the tunnel and in the dark. And like them, most of us are a little unwilling to go where the key might be found. It unlocks the things that we need to find. It means going into the darkness. And we want to stay where the light is. Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, says this, those of us who wish to draw near to God should not be surprised when our vision goes cloudy, for this is a sign that we're approaching an opaque splendor of God. 
If we decide to keep going beyond the point where our eyes and our minds are of any help to us, we may finally arrive at a pinnacle of our spiritual journey toward God, which exists in complete dazzling darkness. While I'm looking for something large, bright, and unmistakably holy, God slips something small, dark, and apparently negligible in my pocket. How many other treasures have I walked right by because they didn't meet my standards? At least one of the lessons from today's text is that I need to let go of the bright ideas I have about God so that my eyes are open to see who God truly is. Brown Taylor writes further, I've learned things in the dark that I could nev never have learned in the light. Things that have saved my life over and over again so that there's really only one logical conclusion. I need the dark as much as I need the light. Many of the clients that I've seen over 25 years of clinical practice come in presenting a problem that is really an opening of a door into something deeper and darker. They're in some pain, and the key to healing their lives is found in some darkness that up to this point they've successfully managed to avoid. In a wound that is older and deeper than the incident that propelled them to call me. And when we begin to move into that darkness, we either find light to guide them, or they stop coming to see me. Those who have the courage to wade into their personal darkness find themselves anew and emerge the other side of that changed with a new life. With that revealing of a darker path ahead, Peter's new divine seeing shuts down, and he reverts and sees with an older set of eyes, and he takes Jesus aside and says, no, 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 this cannot happen. It doesn't fit my vision of how and things should be in the direction I want things to go. Peter is scared, and fear will almost always shut off spiritual vision. Peter has gone back to seeing human things and not divine things. His vision has shifted, and he doesn't want to go into the dark. Jesus is telling him that the key to who he is will be found in that darkness. St. John of the Cross once said, If a person wishes to be sure of the road they tread upon, they must close their eyes and walk in the dark. Years ago when I was in the service, I reported aboard my first ship, and I stood my first underway watch at midnight on a dark night at sea. I was a lookout, and they gave us wonderful binoculars, but it was years before uh, night vision goggles were there. So I was standing on a break-in watch on what's called the flying bridge, and scanning the horizon through these binoculars and into the inky darkness. And I saw something, but I couldn't quite make out what it was. So the sailor with me, training me, said, don't look directly at it. Look slightly above it or slightly below it. When I did that, suddenly, clearly, I could see the silhouette of a ship steaming toward us. I had to shift the way I perceived to see what was actually there. The reality is that by going into the dark, Peter is going to find the light, but he can't see that, not when fear has blinded him. Peter's gone back to seeing in an old way. When Peter sees Jesus through that conformed, preconceived way, he has stopped seeing, and it doesn't match what he wants. Just moments before, Peter had seen clearly with spiritual eyes. And then, because of his fear, it shuts down. And he hangs on to an old life and is in danger of losing the larger life Jesus wants to give him. Most of us want to stay where the light is familiar and illuminating. And we risk losing that larger life. In this passage, the word lose your life, the word life there doesn't refer to bios biological life. It refers, refers to psyche, the eyes of the soul. It's with the eyes of the soul that we see and are able to answer the question, 
who do you say that I am? When we think about it, a great deal happens in the dark. God created out of the chaos and the dark. We only see the stars through the dark night of sky, dark sky of night. Jacob wrestled with an unknown angel in the dark, and they went to the tomb in the dark. Light is often found in the darkness if we're willing to go there. There is a light, Brown Taylor writes, that shines in the darkness, which is only visible there. The unknown is a form of darkness that we can either embrace and explore or shrink back from. In dark times, people respond by rushing back into the light. Generally, we want to rush in and turn the lights of our human understanding on. And when we do that, what the darkness has to teach us is often lost. We're in dark times now, environmentally, culturally, politically, nationally, and as a church. The future is uncertain, somewhat dim and dark, and what we do with it, how we respond to it, will tell us who we are. Do you see with divine eyes, or with secular eyes that see only through fear and judgment? What's the light that guides you and me? in the gathering of darkness. Nancy shared a wonderful Wendell Berry poem with me to know the dark, and it gives us some advice. To go in the dark with the light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark, go without sight, and find that the dark too blooms and sings, and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. That line, to go in the dark with the light is to know the light. Brings back another very reminiscent passage to me from John's beautiful prologue. In him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and will not overcome it. Go with that light into the darkness of your life. Know that light and let it guide you. Amen. Let us stand in the light and affirm our faith together. We believe that our lives are held within the encircling love of God. Who knows our needs and recognizes our deepest needs. We believe that Christ is the divine child of the living God, and that his grace is like living waters that can never be exhausted. We believe in the birthing, the renewing, and enabling spirit of God, who yearns over our welfare as a mother yearns for her child. We believe that God is in the arid desert as well as in the green pastures, and that our times and the disciplines are also loving gifts. We believe that our journey has a purpose and a destination, and that our path leads to a new glory we cannot yet imagine. We believe that in the church, we are fellow pilgrims on the road, and that we are called to love one another as God loves us. This is our faith, and we are humbled to profess in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now as we continue in a time of prayer, uh, let us sing together our call to prayer. And know that as we sing, you are invited to light a candle, if you'd like, as a symbol of your prayer.
Gracious and loving God, we come today as your covenant people and grateful for your presence in our lives. When we look upon the beauty of your creation, we give thanks that we see a reflection of your glory. Hear our prayers of joy and thanksgiving this day and maintain in us grateful hearts that we might forever be doers of your will for us. Draw us into your loving embrace and heal the wounds of our lives. Some here today are consumed by physical pain or face medical procedures yet to come. Be in their healing presence. And for those drawn down by mental illness or uncertainty today, God, fill these dark holes with your grace and mercy. For those who bear the scars of broken hearts, those who feel as if they've lost their way, those who yearn for your guidance as they face the future, God, be present in all of our lives. Merciful Creator, we pray as well for those in our community of faith today in need of your touch. We pray for Matthew today, Jeff and Melissa McConnell's son, who is in the hospital. I give thanks for the many who teach our children and share your great message with them. We pray for Mary Bass receiving this prayer call today, and we ask for your healing touch in her life. And for others whose names rest on our hearts today, be they out of joy or with concern. Congregation, I invite you to lift these names aloud now. God of matchless grace, fill us with gratitude for the gift of life. Guide us in paths of peace and empower us with your spirit to pray and to work for justice, for the coming of that day when swords will shall be beaten into plowshares and all creation lives together in dignity, righteousness, and peace. Give us all this and keep us from fear and greed and help us to know the transformational power of your love. Enable us to be your people of compassion and love, while being mindful of the power of a simple smile, a handshake, a kind word, in our homes, our communities, and our world. Now let us pray together that timeless prayer, saying, Our Father, Let us now give a portion of that back. Will the ushers please come forward to collect our gifts and cards? <clears throat>
May this offering serve as a powerful witness to this world in need. Guide us as we administer the gifts you have given us for the building of the kingdom. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let's join together now in our closing hymn, What I Have Answered When You Call. 2137 in the faith we sing. Thank you.